was the toughest city that we went to in Africa? In terms of just like zaniness of craziness, probably. I don't know. For me, a toss up between Dakar and Bamako. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think Dakar. The driving, the driving situation in Dakar was insane. But we got help. We did get help. Bride, bride's help. Yeah, wouldn't we, wouldn't we actually get pulled over for driving in the bus lane? Driving in the bus lane, right? <laughs> They bust some taxi right where there's cars all over the place coming up another road. Okay, that's it. See the car now? Sorry, sorry, sorry. We go to the police station. You pay and you, and you go you go away. This way. All this and taxi will take this way. Is there a sign that says that? Is there a sign that says that? Because we didn't see a sign. Can we? Do we have to go to the police station or can we pay here? Yeah, this is us. You go with him at the police station. Can we pay right here? We can't pay right here? You want to pay here? Yeah. If you like. How much is it? If you want, for him. How much? 6,000. 6,000. Okay. So I got Russell for always. 6,000 for everybody? For, all for everybody. All together? For, for, uh, for, 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 for you all. How about 10,000? That seems, because we can't read French. And the sign was in French, so... Yes. You take French francs, okay? Okay, yeah, problem. Do you have any on you? No. Uh, we better speak the rest of here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, can't go this way. Okay. Tell you who, exactly. Uh, That's the balance. Hotel Croix du Sud? Croix du Sud. Oui. Yeah. Michael Laden. Say who? Me. I can give you half in francs and half in dollars. That's okay. Wait, Wait, Say Say bien? Say bien. Non, vous donnez not half francs. Deux francs francs, c'est ce que vous voulez. Je peux vous donner un demi en francs français et un demi en dollars. C'est bien. Pourquoi? Vous donnez ça tous en francs français? No. Nous n'avons rien d'argent maintenant. That was a traffic violation. We were on a bus and taxi route, can't you tell? Oh, uh, no, not really. Exactly. Can we move out? We're moving out. What's the biggest bribe we had to pay in Africa? Dollar value, God, I don't know. Yeah, that one, I'm not sure. I remember when we, towards the beginning of the trip, when we had all those cartons of cigarettes, we were kind of giving away cartons of cigarettes, and like, that seems like. You got three currencies in the world the British pound, the American <laughs> dollar, and Marlboro Red. <laughs> Actually, if you remember, we had camel cigarettes with us, and, and all of them there were like, they had never seen camel. They were like, camel? Camel! Camel! Like that? Like the camel? Like, yep. Yeah. What was the best dish that we created in camp in a, in, on our Africa trip? I think the best dish, at least from my memory, was uh, it was somewhere in Mali, and we had gotten some local potatoes and local produce to add to our many, many cans of spam that we brought with us. Um, but yeah, we just made an awesome. But I don't know if you want to call it stir fry. I guess it was fried spam too. I would call yeah. it. I would call it stir-fry pasta dish. Because didn't we also Oh, it was. I was thinking rice. No, you're right. I think right, it was right. pasta. It was pasta. Oh, and actually, I remember Al making some really good, uh, like, clam... Remember you had, like, oh, clam clams? white sauce. Clam, white yeah, yeah, sauce, yeah, 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 yeah. pasta. Yeah, that was really good. That was really good. That was good. Most out-of-this-world experience in Africa. Out-of-this-world experience. I was thinking the guy that came over the top of the sand dune. Yeah. We're all in camp. Right? Yeah, you're right. That was actually, for him, it was almost out of this world because he thought we were from another planet. <laughs> so we're like sitting in camp, and, and uh, I think at the time I was dumping water cans, of jer jerry cans yeah, of water, right. because we were trying to lower our weight. And yeah. he knew that 
I think it was probably eight hours or something. We were outside of, I want to say, near Gow. Me, it was after or Gow. Gow, maybe. It was after Timbuktu. It was after Timbuktu. So, but we were out. I mean, it was out in nowhere, though. Yeah. I was dumping water cans. The crew was setting up, uh, you know, for dinner, for cooking dinner. And everybody had their little thing that they were doing, right. a little chore. We each had our job. <clears throat> and um, all of a sudden, we, I, like, you know, glanced over my shoulder or something. And, you know, when you know you're being watched, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. watching It did us. feel that way. It's funny, yeah. And all of a sudden, there's, like, this shepherd guy standing on this dune. And... Anyway, so the guy comes kind of wandering down, and, and the weird thing is, you could tell he was dressed like a shepherd, but there, there was no sign of any animals that I ever saw. At all. Um, and he came down, and he just kind of stood there, and well, no, he, he just squatted down, and it was like he was watching television. He, he was yeah, exactly. And the weird part about the whole thing was like you just very quickly came to the realization that. Uh, I think he thought we fell out of the sky. Well, like, I think so too, because if I remember correctly, someone had set up a camera tripod and a camera to take pictures of the moon, like setting, you know, back in, well, the truck and tree, I think, we're trying to yeah. do that, something. So yeah, so I think he was like, wow, they're like sending messages to their home planet. Yeah. It, he had never seen, well, if you tell the whole story later on, you, we, we finally figured out, like, there was clearly he had never really seen too many outsiders because we good. we sort of tried to invite him to dinner. And obviously with the language barrier and stuff, it was it was a little tough. Because we tried everything. Because we, we had picked up a little bit of, I mean, we tried French, tried a little bit of Wolof. Uh, Wolof. 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 But yeah, it was, it was just not happening with communication. So we kind of invited him to dinner. So we all sat around. We handed him a bowl of that night was whatever we were making. I think that night was spam and rice. Yeah. And uh, and then you and your culturally I try to be. I mean, recognizing whatever sensitivity, sensitivity to other right. cultures. Paul decides to draw what I can only describe as the worst picture of a pig I've ever seen. Well, okay, okay. Because what I was trying to do was basically, I assume, number one, here's the ignorant part of like being sensitive to culture. I have no idea if he was a Muslim. Right. But we assumed. I assumed. Right. I assumed we tried that. to draw a pig. So I, but it, you kind of tried to draw Well, it kind of looked like a giraffe. <laughs> it had a long neck. <laughs> Except Yeah, nice. uh, maybe. Anyways, anyway, the 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 verbal language that we were communicating with him didn't work, and I'm pretty sure the picture drawing communication didn't work either. Well, you know what's funny? You know, what just dawns on me actually, is that let's just say everyone in that area is Muslim. There's probably no pigs, so he maybe has never even seen a pig. Right, and I could <laughs> I could I could interject a little bit here and say. Is there really pork in spam, anyways? God knows. <laughs> you know. Hey, right? don't knock spam. True, it's very good fried, and we'll we'll talk about that at a later date about <laughs> making spam recipes. But anyways, so he sits down. We hand him a bowl and and silverware, as the rest of us sat around the uh, the camp, and he kind of looked at us, and I don't know whether there was an element of. Maybe they're poisoning me, or or what it was. But like, he wouldn't eat anything until we started eating anything. Remember, and it took a while for him to like. Well, I think he was watching us too, because like he was probably like, oh, how do we use the microphone? Yeah, and that was the weirdest thing, because like we pretty sure, and he didn't, and he didn't use it right. Yeah. He was kind of like. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. So then we handed him yeah. some yeah. USA yeah. cola. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, unfortunately, we were so remote you couldn't get Western Coca Cola, and the store had something called USA Cola. Anyways, that had, that's okay. how, that was the moment that I realized that he really did not have any kind of outside influence, if you will, because he took the can and was like, like this. Oh, yeah. Remember? Yeah, he was yeah. like, yeah. And we were like, what is he doing with the can? Yeah. And it was like, he obviously never had held a soda can before. Yeah. And he didn't know how to open it. I don't know what he, I don't even know if he knew what it was. Yeah. You know? So I think we opened it and we kind of showed him 
I think he drank it. I think so. And then, of course, the joke. And then, so, anyways, then dinner ends, and he kind of just got up and wandered off over the sand dune. And we're all like, we may have just killed this guy. And I don't remember <laughs> him talking at all. Like, no. Not trying to no, I don't, say no, anything no, with him. No, or like... I don't think so either. He just kind of, he, he really treated it felt complete to me anyways it completely felt like we were the aliens mm -hmm. and he came in and, and observed and then left he probably went back to his village at some point or in his life or probably walked and back to his sheep that were out in the middle of somewhere 10 miles away probably yeah. well he must have seen us drive in somehow he's probably there. I guess I yeah. which kind of brings up my old thing which is a weird thing in what I found out from traveling through all sorts of remote parts of the world is that there are people everywhere. There's nowhere you can go anywhere where there's not people. So it's, it, it, you feel like you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And next thing you know, some guy pops over the top of the sand dune. Yeah. Pretty sure that happened to us in the middle of the Sahara somewhere. We stopped for like a, a pee at lunch break or something. And there was like, I mean, nothing around us. And all of a sudden, like from another sand dune, it's like, oh, hey. Yep. They, 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 they were pretty, they spoke French. Yeah, I was like, where the hell did they just come from? What do you like most about Marrakesh? For me, I have no issue with, like, getting lost in places and just paying someone, like, you know, a couple bucks to help me find my way. <clears throat> so just wandering around in the Medina and, like, taking in the smells and the, the, the sights and the colors and the people. And, like, it was almost... That was probably my one of my first times in, like, a real African... Medina market kind of place, and it was just like sensory overload. Like, the wow. spices, the um, the smells, the amazing. and I love the how they do the. And then you see this all over the world, like the cone, the, the, the spice cone, yeah. where they pour it down. Yeah. It's like these cones of different colors. And like yeah, that was that was the the clothing there too is unbelievable. Like mm -hmm. the different colors that people wear, and like the yeah. just. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Mike. Did you fall asleep in Grand Rapids? Do you have any memories of the uh, any hotels in uh, Africa? Oh God, yeah, always on. The room was not good enough to stay in the room, not even on top of the bed. Like you had to, we went in the trucks in the garage outside. Well, yours is clean. I come out like that. Yours did the black stuff. <laughs> you don't want black stuff in your shower. No. Get what you pay for. There's lots of perceived value here. <laughs> Cost ratio is light and light. <laughs> See you guys tomorrow. We'll see you in the morning. So you're gonna do all the knock knocking, right? Yep. Okay. That's one of the, the that's one of the memories I remember the most about that trip. When people ask me how was the quote off road experience, and right. my first my mind goes immediately to the corrugation, like the road and what it did to both us as people. And the truck itself, like, yeah. like, I mean, it, 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 well, first of all, I, I had to take eight years to rebuild the truck when we got home because the bulkhead snapped, the windows, I don't know if you remember, one of the rear windows in the, uh, that's framed by the aluminum, yeah. the, the hairline cracks developed on all sides and the window literally fell out of the truck. Well, and that's why my door wouldn't really, well, by the end of the trip, it wouldn't really open. The door, but, well, I can remember, <laughs> yeah, because you're right, when we were in, um, the Amy, we were all worried about the security of the trucks all the time when we were in that parking <laughs> at the hotel, and finally we were just like, I remember, remember you were out there like body slamming yeah. the truck, trying to get the door so we could, I could lock it from yeah. the inside. And finally, we were just like, yeah, that's not going to happen ever. <clears throat> um, but most of that was caused by like the corrugation, and, and that's one of the things that I realized for the future is the 88, uh, 88 inch wheelbase on the series Land Rover was too short yep. and just whatever the, the the dynamics or the harmonics of the the wheelbase versus the 
weight corrugation develops or whatever the science behind it, who knows. But we literally just, we could never get a speed that was right. right. It was either. Well, and like like Shane was saying, it's true. Like, we'll just drive faster. And like, sometimes that definitely works. You kind of scoot over the top of them. But in an overly laden 1965 Land Rover, the top speed is 40. 40. Anyways. Like, we couldn't no go speed. fast enough. Right. Like we we needed to go a speed that the truck didn't go <laughs> right. to go over the top of the corrugation. Right. It wasn't going to happen. Right. And and of course Shane was CB or, or radioing on the CB saying, "Hey, I just found out if I drive faster, I could cut down on the shaking." But right. like, but he's driving a V8. 101 right. with a 101 inch wheelbase. Right. And I wonder if it, the bigger tires. Yeah, I think it made all the difference. Somehow. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing I remember most about when, when, well, when people say, what was the worst road conditions or the worst places they drove? I mean, the other thing is, is we drove, I think at one time I had charted out, it was like almost 700 miles in low range. Wow. Remember we went through Lyon? Well, we went through Western oh, Sahara. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we went through down the, um, the military convoy route. Yep. And then the Spanish road there and in Mauritania. And the, and the yep. Spanish road. And then we left Noah Debu and went on the beach and then through the Sahara. Right. So all of that it was all off-road. I mean, it was all in low range, essentially. And I, you know, I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've driven that many miles in low range <laughs> in all my other vehicles combined in my whole life. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily because the conditions were that rugged or no, you know right, I mean? right, but but there right. was just moments of the surface would change right you know we went from I, I don't know like the piece like the hard pan stuff to, yep. to soft you'd almost get no warning you know like all of a sudden you'd be like well typically all you get is like that looks a little different color up there that's a little more that's lighter so that means we're going to get stuck there because the sand dune is kind of taking over the road a bit like that really that's, that's I hard. remember a couple times you'd be like and I'd be just kind of like driving and you'd be like bike bike <laughs> what <laughs> you know downshift there we go there we go but uh yeah yeah that i think was um the hardest road the hardest or the most difficult scenario i think that we ever that we faced on that on that on that Africa trip was probably the the, the beach road or, or having to drive along the beach. So, what was the parameter behind that? That that, that whole thing was so that wasn't the whole section. So, driving from Noah Depot to Noakchot, Mauritania, is about 300 miles, and at the time there was no road. So right, or there is a road. But there's this, that section where you have to drive on the beach, at least then. It's like the sand dunes went, like, from here, like, 100 miles that way. Yeah. So the road was like, unless you made a big right. detour and came around, this is not going to happen. So, I don't know how many miles total you had to drive on the beach, but you had to, you had to enter that section at a certain time based on the time. Right. Because uh, if you were caught in between that section at, at high tide... Right. Are gonna become a floating land rover. Right. Well, I remember saying that a few times. Like as we were driving, it's like there's like cliffy dunes right there. Like if you if the tide's coming in, like you ain't going nowhere. Like right. you can't just oh we'll take a left and get out of here. Like nope. No. You're becoming a floating land rover. You're right. And for us, our challenge in our truck was that we were driving on the beach. Probably I would have to say probably 30 miles an hour, maybe, 25 yeah. maybe, yeah. and. The beach obviously angles down to the water, right. so we were listing. <laughs> and, and listing, and I mean the truck was already listing, and we'll just say that the heavier passenger, <laughs> <laughs> heavier heaviest occupant was on the passenger side. Well, we had no, so we had you on the passenger side. We had the ARB cooler on the passenger right, side, right, right. and for some reason we were listing a little bit to the right, anyways, on that truck. Uh, but then on top of it, it, it so so the, the problem came in is. We were trying to avoid hitting the the, the the actual tire on the wheel well. Right. And before that, we had left on the trip. We took out um, the 
what do you call it, the, uh, the suspension straps and everything to, to free up the suspension oh, so we yeah, have more yeah, yeah. travel. The axle straps. The axle straps and everything we have taken off. And um, I just remember driving and like, I think I think it was almost like a comedy movie where we were, we were coming up and you know, you'd go over like little ups and downs of the beach and every time you go on up, we'd, we'd both go like this and be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were like trying to sway our body weight right. to the left. <laughs> And then you hear this like, mm. <laughs> yeah. oh my god, that was interesting. <laughs> well, that reminds me too. You just got me thinking about the suspension on your truck. <clears throat> and if you remember correctly, I know what you're gonna say. I you know. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm sure you do. Um, I don't know. It was, it was a, a time before the trip, maybe a couple years or maybe 18 months or something. Uh, and we were uh, replacing. I it think was the part of springs, the. Right? It was part of the prep for the trip, but it was yeah. like you said, it was well before. Yeah. yeah. And we replaced. I think we replaced the leaf springs, right? The we replaced the we, leaf springs and the shocks. And the, I no, I put on the. Um, oh, the, the heavy, heavy duty. duty uh, the heavy duty. One hundred nine. Yep. Yep. One hundred nine. Yep. So I remember, and then you know, a lot of it as we started getting the project, it was like, oh man, that uh, bushing, like, ugh, that's got to be replaced. But, you know, my garage at the time, I didn't have a press and all that. So we actually did pretty well with what we have. But there was one bushing that we just, I think it snapped in half, right, as we yeah. pulled it out. It's like, well, how do you put in half a bushing? So And about right. six hours later, we were still trying to figure that right. question out. Right. So eventually, I mean, i, I got to say, it worked because it worked. But we uh, made a duct tape bushing. Half of the one of the the, the the suspension bushings was made out of duct tape. And true story, we went through Africa eight thousand miles with that. Yep. And that was now seventeen years ago. Yep. Which oh, almost, is it still there? You it's never, still there. Oh, I thought you. Nope, it's still in the. So truck. let me get this. You restored the entire truck, but yep. didn't. We I did well like because that. I restored the truck from the, once coming back from Africa. We stripped down the truck. We took the engine out. Uh, we took all the panels off, the body off of the truck, the tub, everything. But I didn't restore the frame down. So, I, well, I, I think I sanded down the frame and re, uh, repainted it black, but I didn't do anything of the components down below. So I, I just never restored that. Um, because the, so it's kind of a heritage truck at this point, because if you remember, we only have a rear diff from a Spanish Santana from Africa that's still in the truck yep. to this day as well. Yep. Um, and then something we did something with the front diff as well because it's different because of the stock diff from that year has um, you know the uh, the, the oil uh, drain is a is it I call it an any oh, yeah, 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 it's now right. an Audi so it's something different about it but that's right. But anyways, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. That has the uh, we call it the duct tape. Pushing. <laughs> hey, yeah. it worked. Yeah. And continues to work, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of memories about driving in the truck. Yeah. Because if you think about it, you put two oh. adults in a in an eighty eight inch land rover that is admittedly <clears throat> grossly overweight. Grossly overweight. And we get some feedback sometimes from people on YouTube and other places like you guys went to Africa, you know what you're doing, your trucks are overweight, the blah blah blah, right. the tires are too you're right. up. Yep, oh, correct. All <laughs> correct. However, it wasn't like we didn't know that this was the case. Right. I mean, we were well aware. Well, of I mean, maybe we didn't know quite how overlaid. But how do you know well, until you go and Yeah, I mean, and there was a and there was a significant period of time that we unpacked and packed and pa unpacked right. and repacked and unpacked. And you know, we were trying to get the weight down as much as possible. Right. But the reality is, is when you're, uh, you know, you're facing a an expedition of that length with eight guys and a lot of diverse and unknown conditions. You know, and you got to also remember it was 17 years ago. So this is before internet, right? Um, modern phone technology, cell phones, things like that. That like you could communicate and get things. Right. So we kind of went with what we felt like was what we needed for that amount of time. Right. And, but I just remember like, you know, when you put the two guys and the gear behind you in an 88, and then of course we had the roof rack, 
with the rooftop tent. Yep. Had a couple jerry cans on the roof. Yep. We had the, the second spare tire, because we had one oh, spare tire right. on the hood, and then we had a second oh, spare tire right. that we made a custom mount above the windshield. That's right. Which added too much weight to the to the bulkhead to the windshield, which contributed obviously to the breakdown of that. Part and that's of the where truck. we also like that's where we had our our clothes and everything because like, that's where we, we had, had it ready. Yeah, that's right. So the opposite the tent, we had the two uh, boxes. Because I just remember part of the the whole setup takedown at camp every day was inevitably somehow we were always taking those bins from the roof. Remember? Yep. And I'd go on the roof and then I'd push the bin down to you on the spare tire and then yep. we, you know because they weighed. Incredible amounts. Thanks for watching this video. If you like what we're doing, be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking on the truck and tree symbol to your right. Once again, thanks and hope to see you soon.